Yep. Hi, this is Joe Fodery for the National Network of State Teachers of the Year. And I'm honored to have Dorena Sackman with me tonight. Dorena teaches English as a second language to eighth graders at West Ridge Middle School in Orange County, Florida. She is the 2014 Florida Teacher of the Year and was recently named a finalist for National Teacher of the Year. Dorena, I'd like to welcome you to our show tonight and congratulations for all your accolades. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, you've been on a roller coaster ride uh, since your career started. And if you can, could you take just a few moments, kind of carve out how you got started in teaching, and then I want to kind of move over a little bit to what the last year has been like with the State Teacher and the National Teacher of the Year journey. Great. Uh, I can start with that I actually um, went to school uh, for international economics and French. And I really wanted to be a French teacher until I got very interested in business uh, and then realized that I wasn't very good at it. And so <laughs> I wound up actually just being um, a girl and followed my high school sweetheart and from New York to Boston. And um, that's where, although the personal part didn't work out, I wound up realizing a dream of mine, which was that I have a knack for languages. And I wound up realizing that uh, very quickly I picked up about three or four languages. And uh, after speaking to my mother, who went back to school at the age of 40 to become a teacher, an um, FBLA teacher, Future Business uh, Leaders of America teachers in Title I schools, she said, you need to do this. This has always been something that you love. You love teaching English to, you know, adults that you've been doing. Why not get your master's? So at the encouragement of my mother, a teacher, I went back to school at UMass Boston to get my master's in English as a second or other language and applied linguistics and bilingual education. And before I knew it, I wound up teaching. Um, my first job was a third and fourth grade bilingual Portuguese class, wow. and it was absolutely amazing, and I loved it. And uh, just a phenomenal experience that led me then uh, about seven years in Boston. And then my grandmother told me that uh, she wants me to move to move in with her in Florida, and of course you listen to your grandmother when she talks to you. <laughs> and uh, my whole family moved down to Florida, so I followed my grandmother, and she said, I'm going to teach you how to cook so you can get a husband someday. And I said, okay, sounds great, Nana. And I did, and I learned to cook very well and also learned to become Florida Teacher of the Year because of my passion of teaching children from all around the world. And there's definitely a lot here in Florida. Wow, well, that's outstanding. I, I was reading earlier that I believe you speak five languages. Is that correct? It is, yes. I speak five languages, um, four absolutely fluently. The fifth one, um, I want to call it the Brooklyn Italian, if you will, you know, once again from my nonna. And then I'm working on my sixth right now, which is Arabic, and that is just so different from the Romance languages. And, you know, everyone has a hobby, and for me, I'll just pick up, you know, the grammatical structure of Russian, and I think it's fascinating, whereas, you know, one plus one is 11 to me. So we all have our, <laughs> our four days, if you will. <laughs> so what, what's been the attraction for language? And then how do you translate that over to your students who may not have the same passion, but you've obviously been able to connect with them to help them achieve at a very high level? Yeah, I think the, the passion for language comes from the passion of culture, because language is culture. And in order for you to really break that communication gap, it ne doesn't necessarily have to just be linguistically. Uh, you can get to know someone through basically their own culture and understanding them, but, you know, it's a plus to have the language. And when you really do that, you break so many barriers and you get to talk to so many people, and it really happens through traveling as well. Um, you know, I saved up every ounce of money possible as a teacher to at least give myself one trip per year so that I can really expand my horizons. And from there, I just realized that, we all are the same. We really are. And the only differences are the things that we should celebrate. And from that, I just said I need to learn more languages so I can communicate with other people so that people can see that sometimes the American um, woman, when we travel, they could be perceived as something different. And I wanted to be an ambassador to American women and let people know that we are highly educated and that we are uh, truly out there to just to, to to spread the word of knowledge and let us know, other people know that you know we have a lot to give and and from that other people have become fascinated vice versa and I've met people from all around the world and it just has opened up so many doors and I expand that to my students letting them know that 
your voice, you know, you fuel them with knowledge, but you also give them a voice by teaching them English, but by letting them know that I speak other languages, they become fascinated by others as well and become fascinated by their student, by their fellow colleagues and their peers. So now it's not something that's so different that I have a student from Vietnam and a student from Mexico. It's, well, Missy gets to understand them a little bit, so I want to understand them as well. And it's this wonderful connection that we all have through a disconnect at first. And with the disconnect, of course, is the English, but then through together, we can all come together and, and really try to understand each other. And that is my entire goal in my classroom. That's why I call it the little United Nations, because <laughs> these children are just so amazing how much they just love each other. It's just fantastic. We can learn a lot from eighth grade kids. <laughs> For sure. And do you find your kids connect pretty quickly uh, through your passion? I know my first year uh, when I started teaching English, I thought every kid in America uh, love diagramming sentences as much as I did. And you know what? I found out I was wrong, uh, <laughs> but they didn't. And uh, I, I'm still shocked by that. But, I mean, how long do the kids take to usually warm up to you and really fight through those barriers? Because some people do pick up language quicker than others, and some not so much. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what the connection rate is, do you think, during the course of the year and how that works? <clears throat> Um, for me, and please excuse it, it sounds a little pretentious, but it's really truly my, my whole reason for teaching, which is the incredible connection I have with my students instantly. Um, because I strongly believe that we must know our students' stories before we can even teach them. So before I even start to teach my students the English language or the concept of the English language in, in, in American school setting, um, I know each and every one of them. I have this survey that I have to give to them, their parents, their pastors, their imams, their, their rabbis, whoever it is in their communities that they have to fill out in order for me to get to know them. And when I do that and then they answer it in their native language, we do the best we can to communicate and get the answers. And when we do, I incorporate that into my lessons so that already their effective filter is lowered and they really have an understanding because it really is just connection first because we have these kids that are being picked up from other countries, from political asylum, natural disaster, or um, refugees, or just to pursue the American dream under their parents that are making them do this. And at first, they're scared and they're afraid, but when you have that connection with them, anything is possible. And then when you also know their background academically, socioeconomically, you know all of those aspects of it, you then can see how you can assess how children learn language. And you know some are the silent period and won't speak for three months, and then some will just want to just keep going and just speak as much as they can, even if they're not really speaking that well. It's their, their voice is out there. And you begin to understand, and then that's how you pr create this perfect differentiated instructional type of classroom. And it's just such a wonderful experience because then everybody gets to understand each other and how they learn. And then from there, they feed off of each other, and everyone becomes little managers and assistant managers of the room, and uh, they help each other out. And it's just a great, great moment. And, and, you know, you really have to know your kids, and once you know them, bam, you've got them. That's for sure. And, you know, you mentioned something earlier about the, the name Florida Teacher of the Year. I, I kind of want to segue over to that a little bit. How are Teachers of the Year identified in your state? Everybody, Every state has a little bit different process. and Florida has been uh, highly recognized, you know, with several finalists over the last few years, and just kind of curious how that works with, with your state. Yeah, five years in a row. I know I like to call myself the Susan Lucci of uh, Florida Teachers of the Year for those who watch uh, daytime television. So <laughs> let's go for a good one this year. But in all honesty, they, um, they choose from their schools. Everyone chooses from their school. And then from their school, um, they fill out an application. Um, it's quite intense, about 26 to 27 pages of philosophy of education and, and um, how you feel about education and issues, as well as recommendations and resumes and, and a couple of about 10 questions that you have to answer. And that then you go into your district. And if you're chosen by your specific district, and there's over 13,000 uh, teachers just in my district alone, Orange County, and there's 71 districts in the state of Florida. So there's about 189,000 teachers that are each trying for Teacher of the Year, and they're selected by their peers at first. And then they're selected by their county and members of the county and their superintendents and a board of the community as well from the county. And then they go to the state. 
So uh, each person from the county goes to the state, in which then you fill out another 42 pages of, uh, of philosophies of education and issues in education today, which is a great thing to write about. And then you are selected by a committee, again, the community as well as the Department of Education. And from there, you're chosen in July as Florida Teacher of the Year, and you are the Krista McAuliffe Ambassador to Education, where you go around on sabbatical to the state, as well as various places in the country, um, advocating for your platform and for elevating the teaching profession. Wow. And so what was – take me through the night when you were named and what the response has been like oh. from your family, colleagues, and students when they heard you were named Florida Teacher of the Year. My students have been incredible. I mean, they've just been unbelievable. They're the most supportive out of everything. But a lot of times they're like, Missy, because they call me Missy, <laughs> which is uh, my nickname for the past, because that's a term of endearment in a lot of countries, and Miss becomes Missy. They say, Missy, we don't want you to win because we want you to be back next year. <laughs> so it's a great feeling to know that they love you that much, that although they want you to win, they still want to see you. And so I made note to make sure that I was always still in contact with them. Um, my parents, being my mother, being an educator, they just are just so proud and just so happy. And um, my grand grandmother, who has soon passed on, she unfortunately wasn't there, but I know she was there in spirit. And she always pushed me to make sure that I always continued with my passion, which she saw in my eyes was always my students every single day. I love my kids. And um, as far as my colleagues, that was the biggest supportive thing. There is nothing there is no better compliment in the world than to be at the Florida Teacher of the Year night and have, you know, 50 of the 70 come up to you at one point or another and say, it would be an honor if you were representing us. And when, you, when your colleagues say that, you know that you've made a difference in such a short period of time of meeting them. And then the moment that Governor Scott called my name, I was shocked, to be honest with you. I, I really thought it was going to somebody else and um, deservingly so, and, and then all of a sudden I couldn't believe it, and someone said I had 30 seconds to talk, and I said, oh my gosh, what am I going to say, and that's when I came up with the acronym BELIEVE, and um, because the theme of this year in Florida was BELIEVE, and I've always taught my students at a moment of nervousness, take a word and create an acronym out of it, and that's exactly what I did. I had 30 seconds to get up there and thank everybody, and instead I just went, you know what, we need to believe, B-E-L-I-E-V-E, -E -E, be the educators who live to inspire and empower via excellence. And that became the theme for this year. Well, that's outstanding. And, you know, what a, what a magical night. I, I think you would agree with this, that all, all of the teachers here that I've spoken with, I think one of the only regrets they have is that every educator in the state couldn't be on the stage with them and be able to share because that's such a wonderful time just to, to know that people really care about the profession. Absolutely. And that was one of the things I love that um, it's sponsored by Macy's. And what I love that Macy's did is that they take every single teacher and they just praise them and they keep them on stage and they keep them there. And I, I only wish that next year, if I have a say in what they do at the Hard Rock there in Orlando, is that they leave all of those teachers on stage because it is about them. It is 100%. I mean, we as Teachers of the Year and the finalists and all the state Teachers of the Year, we're simply conduits or ambassadors for our state. And so for us to be that one person on stage, no, it should be every single one of us being the representatives of our counties so that we could at least do that service for all the other teachers that are out there. You know, and you've had a lot of, you've had a lot of change. You've been recognized by the state of Florida. In January, I believe you were named one of four finalists for National Teacher of the Year. And so you've got all this flux going on in your life. Uh, can you kind of describe uh, what this year has been like so far. I know you're out of the classroom, you're traveling around the state, uh, doing all of these different things. Can you kind of give our audience a little bit what it's like in that capacity? Sure. Um, it is something I didn't expect. I really didn't expect to. Um, I'm very proud to say that um, Bonita Hampton, who, who runs the Florida Department of Education Teacher of the Year uh, schedule, she said, which is all through word of mouth, um, through recommendations and word of mouth, that I'm the busiest Florida Teacher of the Year in history, which means that it says a lot about how much education is getting out there. I don't think it necessarily has to do with Dorina Sackman as much as it has to do with 
there is a voice now and people want that voice to be heard and for me to be the voice of those other teachers is important and to be that busy and to have um, three days off in February and to just be constantly traveling and always being keynote speakers or empowering at ESET 2 conferences or, um, you know, my favorite part, which is inspiring pre-service teachers and college students ready to go into the education profession. You are out there as this motivational speaker for something you love so much. And you are going from place to place, inspiring others and leaving your legacy of what you believe so much in education. And it is the most amazing experience that you just don't want it to end. It's, it's empowering others to empower themselves to empower children. And what better thing to do than, than know that you're making that much of a difference. I mean, I love my students. I miss them. I visit them probably twice a week when I can. And I see them in the classrooms and or we'll go, I'll go to their track meets and football games and take them to basketball games. Uh, but at the same time, I know that reaching teachers, I can reach thousands of kids. And that's really what makes the difference. It's well, that's a great a point. journey like I've never had. Yeah, and that's a great point. Uh, teacher voice has kind of become a really powerful movement here in the last two years. And I wonder if everyone understands what teacher voice is. I mean, I think it can mean a lot to a lot of different people. And could you kind of give me your perspective if you were talking in front of an audience today of, of classroom teachers and you were really encouraging them to exercise their teacher voice from your perspective, what would you be talking to them about? That's a great question. Um, teacher voice to me is just truly something that is, um, that is <clears throat> because it's not just, it's about leadership and it's about elevating the profession. We have so many things going on in education right now that are being dictated to us. And some are fantastic and they're going to transform education and others, teachers are questioning, going, is that in best interest for our students? And if we're on the front lines and there we are having this um, ability to see exactly what's going on, we as teachers should also have a say in those decisions. And so teacher voice really is uplifting ourselves in our profession. As I've told to so many people at conferences, we are not just teachers. We are teachers. We need to get that just out of that sentence. And this t way of thinking about teaching is really what initially elevates yourself. And then after you elevate yourself, it's not elevating the profession to go into the next step, which is I need to be a dean and then a system principal. No, it's about the leadership of all of us collaborating together to do what's in best interest for ourselves, our students, our schools, so that we make the gains, not necessarily just in numbers, but the gains we need for our students to become lifelong learners. And it is so empowering when you tell people, you have a say in what you're doing. You just have to learn where. And that's my favorite part, is to advocate for it and to get people out there so that they, too, can go and speak and have their voice and say, hey, this is how I feel about special education. This is how I feel about them. This is how I feel about ESOL. Well, this is how I feel about STEM. And when they have that passion and they have that platform, now it's up to us as Teachers of the Year and just more seasoned teachers to elevate other teachers to say, let me get my voice out there. Whether it's through social media, through speaking in conferences, whether it's going in front of legislature, we need to do that so that strength in numbers can actually make other people say, hey, wait a minute, they're not just teachers. They really are teachers. See the difference? Yeah, and you know, when you see people and you hear people advocating for their profession and you hear them talking about it it's at such a passionate level like you are and also understanding the mechanics about what makes good teaching happen in the classroom, it really educates the mm -hmm. greater community as the things they can do to come in and support teaching. And so I, I love what you're saying and I, I think we're just on the front end of this and it's going to be interesting as you and I journey down this road together along with other, a lot of other their stories as to what teacher voice, teacher leadership is going to look like 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Yes, I mean, it's so um, true. Because at, in, in, 
Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, no, at the Arizona National State Teacher of the Year Conference, I was never the same person. And that's when I met former Teachers of the Year, um, well, excuse me, Teachers of the Year in previous years, and also all the State Teachers of the Year. And that five days, I, I, I was never the same person after that. And I think that I wish all teachers could experience that and see the difference that it can make because it made me really see what the future is. You know, I, I believe so much and, and strongly in, in elevating my specific for, forte, which is ESOL and English language learners. And I didn't know the voice that I could have outside of that as well. And just to, that really is in best interest of students. And I just, I was never the same. I'm still fascinated by it and I can't wait to do more. Well, that's what I actually, a uh, little bit of serendipity here because that's where I was heading at is uh, every year the class of Teachers of the Year get invited together. This year you guys were in Arizona and it's, it, it was an amazing experience for my class and I've heard the same thing from everyone else. But what, give me your perspective of what it was like for the first time to meet all of these different teacher leaders from all of these different backgrounds. I mean, and, and there's, they are so varied that it, to me, I was just awestruck to be in the room and that I, it was such an eye-opening experience as to how passionate teachers are about their kids and their profession, uh, how talented some of these men and women are, and what a privilege it was just to sit there and just to listen to them talk about the great things. And man, I was taking notes left and right trying to figure out how I could use that knowledge back in my classroom. But what was that experience like for you? I, I think you, you summed it up so beautifully, but to add to that, just these 2014 uh, State Teachers of the Year, I, I have almost every one of their faces in there, in my mind right now, and, and just the connections that you make, but really what happened is, is it made me step back and just say, um, the word finalist was erased from me at that time. I didn't, it wasn't about me being a finalist for the nation. What it was, was a colleague of all these people, and I just went, my gosh, am I worthy? These people are amazing. They are doing amazing things in their states, and I want to bottle them all up and take them to Florida because every single one of them had something to believe in so strongly, and they're just their passion, their stories, their, their, their just their joy for what they do. The room was just filled with so much positive energy and such wonderful stories about how much they love this profession that anybody walking into that room would just say, my gosh, I just want to stay here forever because we learned so much from each other. We learned so much from former state teachers of the year and national teachers of the year. We learned so much from Catherine back at the, uh, the head of NNSTOY, and we learned so much that w what we needed to take back to our classroom, but also what we needed for inside of ourselves. And, and to, to really have that together as, as educators is something that I really would strive to have everywhere. It should be more than just one occasion for teachers everywhere because it's just so enlightening. It really was, I, I still can't believe just being in the room with, you know, Lucas Foley from Vermont and, and, and um, the Mariana Islands and to have just these, oh, these incredible teachers and Brett from, uh, oh my gosh, I'm saying all their names because I love them so much I miss them. <laughs> I can't wait to see them in April. <laughs> Well, and that's a great point. So you've got April coming up uh, very quickly, yes. and uh, the National Teacher of the Year will be named. Uh, what's next for you guys, and how's that process? Well, let me ask. Let me let me check. What's the process been like as a finalist? So our audience kind of knows how that works, and then if you can kind of take that on up to the day the teacher of the National Teacher of the Year is named. What, how how is all that going to take place? Well, after being um, honored with uh, being chosen as one of the finalists, myself, Melissa, Sean, and Ryan um, were informed in July, and then we uh, were also uh, noted at the Arizona conference, excuse me, at July in January. We were noted at the end of the uh, conference, which was so overwhelming and so emotional. I was, my cup runneth over. I still will never forget that moment to be in the company of all these people. And then um, in March, we had interviews, and that was very intense, from dinner with 15 incredible judges from all around um, education and various organizations, 
to uh, doing a presentation and a keynote to an interview process to media um, and press uh, questions. It was a three-day journey that in Washington, D.C. that was um, very, it was something I'll never forget. I learned a great deal about myself. I learned a great deal about others. And I just, um, I, I, it's something that I, I will always stay with me. And from there, they, um, we are to be told the April 28th, I believe, the week of April 28th in the White House. I'm so excited um, for the winner. Um, but I don't like to say the word winner. I like to say the one who is chosen to represent all of us. Because there's no question whoever is chosen will be the right person. And that person it will be the perfect ambassador for all of us for the theme for this year, which I truly believe is teacher leadership. And whoever that person will be, that person will be a wonderful example of what education is all about. And I look forward to, to just seeing everybody in April and just meeting the president and first lady and just being in Washington and being part of this peace conference and just seeing everyone and once again empowering each other. It's just an incredible journey. And yeah, we've, we've talked with all four finalists and all of you are really exciting uh, energetic, uh, great ambassadors for the profession, and we're just glad to have had the chance to talk to all four of you and wish each of you the best of luck with things. And, uh, you know, no matter what, I know we're going to have a very strong ambassador out there for the next year out of the class of 2014 representing te teachers nationwide. Um, do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share, maybe a question I didn't ask? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> um, you're just so good at what you do. You're so passionate as well. And I just, I think it's just, I thank you so much for this opportunity and and to talk about just this journey and that um, anyone who is listening and is just thinking about the profession, it's something that you have to know is truly a calling and that you don't have to just go into it right after college. It's something I have so many friends that are going back into the profession um, after being in the business world because they had it in their heart and that if you have that tugging at you, that you should because this profession is something that will always be the most rewarding for yourself and for your students and every day I miss my kids, but I know that, you know, the difference that we're making every single day with teachers and other people and students, it's just the most rewarding thing in the world and I just can't wait. I just can't wait to continue to to be part of this. It's just an amazing experience. Well, welcome to the Instoy family and uh, just like to thank our guest tonight, Darina Sackman. Darina is the 2014 Florida Teacher of the Year and a finalist for National Teacher of the Year. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts and best wishes on a great year, Darina. Thanks, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank Sarah for making all the technology work. This has been Joe Fathery from the National Network of State Teachers of the Year. Check us out on our website at www.nnstoy.org. Look forward to seeing you.